Let China sleep, for when she wakes, she will shake the world. It was first started all the way back in the 19th century by none other than Napoleon Bonaparte, a man who recognized the raw and unrealized potential of the nation that in his time sat in abject ruin, courtesy of incompetent leadership by its then ruling Qing dynasty and external machinations by European powers. It is a quote that seems to get further vindicated with every passing year in the 21st century as the nation continues to make ever grander leaps in its economy its infrastructure, its global presence, and above all else, its military. And in its military, one branch above all others seems to have an uncanny knack for exemplifying China's ever more revolutionary rise to global preeminence, its navy. It is the branch that grabs all of the headlines with its aircraft carriers, its nuclear submarines, and ever more regular and grand military drills off of China's coast. But how did it get this way? What are the key moments in its history? And above all else, what are its capabilities today? Those questions and more are what we're going to answer in the next 20 minutes or so, as we present to you a primer stuffed with all of the information that you need to know to have a half-decent understanding of the Chinese Navy. So let's get into it, shall we? The People's Liberation Army Navy, or Chinese Navy as we'll call it herein to keep things simple, was established on the 23rd of April 1949, right on the tail end of the Chinese Civil War. Its formation unified all of Communist China's scattered and disorganized naval forces under a single unified command structure under the command of the Joint Staff Department, then based in Taizhou, Jiangsu Province. Its ships at that time were, to be blunt, just a bit sh it, both in terms of quantity and quality. The People's Liberation Army, Communist China's army from which the Chinese Navy emerged, was first and foremost a land fighting force. It had been founded all the way back in 1927 as a militia of peasants and intellectuals way deep into China's interior, and so it had neither the funds nor the territory necessary to make a naval force a pressing concern. It stayed this way up until the closing acts of the Civil War. Warlords, the Japanese, and the Nationalists, these were all enemies that could be, and in many cases had to be fought on land, once again not making the establishment of a navy a pressing matter, even if they had been flush with cash. That all changed, however, when the tide of the Civil War started turning in the Communists' favor. Partly this was because, as the Communists slowly assumed the mantle of control over China, they suddenly found themselves with a coastline to defend, but mostly it was a matter of inheritance, because as the nationalists hightailed it across the East China Sea to make their last very long-lived stand on Taiwan, they left behind a lot of ships. Ships for which they lacked either the sailors, the time, or the fuel needed to take with them. And the communists were hardly going to let perfectly good ships go to waste, were they? Quids in. They now had a navy. But, as we've already said, the ships they got their hands on were just a bit crap. Nationalist China was hardly a power that sat on the apex of military technology, and it showed in their ships. A few alright ones were mixed in there, admittedly, like the Rox Chongqing, a originally British Arethusa class light cruiser that defected to the Communists in February 1949, and the Rox Jian, an originally Japanese Type C escort ship that defected to the Communists in April 1949. But Ships of this quality were very much in the minority, and the bulk of the ships were made up of ancient foreign ships that had somehow survived the last 20 years without being sent to the seabed or civilian pattern junks that were jury rigs with whatever firepower was lying around. Naturally, the Chinese Navy was none too chuffed about that state of affairs, so it immediately turned its attention to getting its hands on more ships. These would have to come from foreign powers for now, as China in the late 1940s resembled a 10 million square kilometer bomb site, and it would be a fair odd while until domestic industry was up to the task of building a new navy. They did manage to get their hands on some good stuff, however, including the Wuchan and Jiang, both Soviet Uragan class corvettes and the British flower class corvettes Kai Feng and Fu Po. Ships like these did the job for then at least, but there was still a long way to go. 
Serious efforts to get an indigenous Chinese navy into the water began in the early 1950s, and like most Chinese military modernization efforts of that period, this one would be done with the help of their dear and ideologically aligned friend to the north, the Soviet Union, who happily sent naval attaches, shipyard machinery, technical documents, and even whole ships to China to aid them in their maritime endeavors. Most of the details of this technological slash military slash industrial aid is unknown, so we can't say too much about it beyond the odd fact here and there that has snuck out, such as the fact that at the height of the cooperation in 1958, just shy of 3,000 Soviet naval attaches were in China doing their thing. Well, that all worked a treat, and thanks to the Soviet assistance, China had a modern navy on the go in no time, and it was fielding advanced designs such as the Type 01 Chengdu class destroyer and Type 04 Anshan class frigates, which were Chinese adaptations of the Soviet Riga class and Gnevi class, respectively. Come 1960, however, Chinese and Soviet relations completely fell apart due to ideological differences, with the Soviet Union under Khrushchev wanting to pursue a more liberal communism and China under Mao wishing to carry on with a much more hardline and doctrinal variant of communism. This collapse in relations would later become known as the Sino-Soviet split, and it saw the complete termination of diplomatic relations between the two countries, and naturally that also meant that China was getting no more Soviet help with their navy. Further to this, the other advanced naval powers of the day weren't exactly lining up to help China out either, with the US, UK, France, etc. not exactly being on friendly terms with them. China was on its own from there on out. Fortunately, it had managed to rebuild its naval infrastructure sufficiently and built up a wealth of indigenous expertise, so it actually didn't need help by that point. They just had to roll with it and keep the momentum going. So now, let's move on and look at the later developments that began to create the Chinese Navy as we know it today. To save some space for some more juicy stuff at the end of today's video, let's jump the story forward a couple of decades here to 1978 and the coming to power of Deng Xiaoping. Because as part of his wider reform and modernization drive, the Chinese Navy was given a lot of resources to expand and modernize. Now, don't worry, you aren't missing out on too much in the gap. They polished and refined their Soviet-inspired and assisted designs and put new but more or less equivalent types of their own out to sea as just nothing too crazy. In a nutshell, later modernization efforts, particularly those during Deng Xiaoping's and Xi Jinping's era, were all aimed at the creation of a true blue water navy, i.e. a navy capable of operating globally as opposed to a brown water navy like it had during Mao's and Hua Guofei Feng's tenure i.e. a navy capable of only operating territorially. The rationale for this was pretty simple. If China was to finally cast off the shackles of the century of humiliation and regain its place as one of the geopolitical big boys of the world, well, it needed a big boy navy to back that aspiration up. This effort culminated with top-of-the-line new models of destroyers, frigates, and corvettes such as the Type 052 destroyer introduced in 1994, and modernization of the Type 053 frigate, dubbed the Type 053H3, introduced in 1997, and the Type 056 corvette, introduced in 2013. These are all pretty simple to get your head around. They were bigger, they were faster, and they had juicier tech than those that came before them, including top-of-the-line missile pods, advanced computer-assisted close air defense systems, and radar that could see far out into the distance. The rationale behind developing these was pretty simple. They wanted ships that were on a parity with those of their Western geopolitical rivals. Beyond them, the Chinese Navy also upgraded its amphibious assault ships, enabling projection of power and support for land forces in maritime operations, with notable types introduced being the Type 075 helicopter assault ship, Type 072 landing ship, and the Type 071 amphibious warfare ship. Now, these are a big deal, as they represent a whole new capability for the Chinese Navy, the ability to not just send some boats to the other side of the world and shoot some stuff up, but the ability to send some boats around to the other side of the world and take and hold territory. 
Then there's the People's Liberation Army Naval Air Force, the Chinese Navy's aviation wing, which now actually exists in a meaningful capacity. Growing from a mere afterthought pre-Deng Xiaoping, the branch now boasts over 700 aircraft, including 45 Xi'an H-6 strategic bombers, 120 Xi'an JH-7 fighter bombers, and 72 Shenyang J-11 air superiority fighters. And then there's the matter of aircraft carriers, or rather the fact that China actually has them now, which has improved their capabilities immeasurably. China has always wanted them ever since the communists first came to power back in 1949, but carriers are both expensive and pretty complicated, something that simply put them beyond their capabilities at that time. But with the growing sophistication of their naval industrial sector and their ever-ballooning economy, come the 1970s, the time was finally right to realize that dream. They kept things simple to begin with and opted to walk before they could run, purchasing the recently decommissioned Australian carrier HMAS Melbourne in 1985 and taking it to bits to get their heads around all of its juicy and complex tech, specifically its steam catapult, angled flight deck, and mirror landing aid. They then put what they had learned from the Melbourne into practice by purchasing the half-finished Soviet-era carrier Vyag from Ukraine in 2000 and completing it themselves. Not only did this allow them to dip their toes into the aircraft carrier pool very carefully, but it also gave them the opportunity to tinker with the ship to their own specifications. She was finished and commissioned in 2012, becoming China's first operational aircraft carrier, the Type 001 Liaoning. From there, the next step was to turn the difficulty up a bit and make another Liaoning brand new from the Kiel Up. They completed this in 2019 with the commissioning of the Type 002 Shandong. And do note, despite being very similar inside and out, Shandong was tinkered with and somewhat redesigned mid construction, hence the new designation. Then, the job was a good one, and all that was left to do was take their final big plunge into the carrier pool by building a proper big boy of a carrier. A super carrier. Dubbed the Type 003 Fujian, she is currently undergoing sea trials and is expected to be formally commissioned late this year. We ultimately don't know how good it will actually be when finally finished, but given the fact that it features catabar capabilities, unlike the British Queen Elizabeth class carrier, that's an electromagnetic catapult similar to those on American Gerald R. Ford class carriers and is larger than both the QE class and the French Charles de Gaulle class, it stands to reason it's going to be a damned handy bit of kit, happily comparable to advanced Western carriers. Another big area to consider is that of submarines. The the Chinese Navy has had these pretty much since the offset, but its earlier examples were submarines that they either got directly from the Soviets or indigenous copies thereof, such as the Romeo class of diesel electric attack submarines, which were known as Type 033s in Chinese service. These were great in their day, but come the 1970s and 1980s, they were starting to show their age a bit, and so work began on a whole new generation of modern submarines. In the realm of attack submarines, this work led to the development of the Type 039 class of diesel electric submarine, an advanced design that entered service in 2006 and is notable for its use of an air independent propulsion system, which allows it to operate submerged very quietly and for significant lengths of time. Handy though that certainly is, it is nothing compared to the Type 093 class of nuclear powered attack submarines that also entered service in 2006, it being nuclear powered being a big deal for for reasons that we certainly don't need to explain to you. And then there's the submarine type that every geopolitical big boy craves. Ballistic missile submarines, the ones that can launch nuclear-tipped missiles from anywhere on Earth. China currently has one class of these in service, the Type 094. The first entering service in 2007, this nuclear-powered class of submarines comes equipped with all the stealth technologies one could ever want, and currently comes equipped with 12 JL-3 intercontinental ballistic missiles, each carrying either a single large 1 megaton warhead or eight 150 kiloton independently targetable warheads when configured as a multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle. So then, now we have an idea of the type of shiny new ships that the Chinese Navy boasts, so you're no doubt wondering just how many of them it has. 
Well, to answer that, let's blast through a list and add them up, shall we? Aircraft carriers, three. Landing helicopter docks, three. Amphibious transport docks, eight. Tank landing ships, 36. Medium landing ships, also 36. Nuclear ballistic missile submarines, seven. Nuclear attack submarines, nine. Conventional attack submarines, 45. Destroyers, 49. Frigates, 42. Corvettes, 72. Missile boats, 107. Submarine chasers, 26. Gunboats, 17. Mine countermeasure vessels, 36. Replenishment oilers, 16. Auxiliaries of all types, 233. By our maths, put the size of the Chinese Navy at the time of writing as 745 strong. This happily makes makes it the largest navy in the world, followed by Russia, North Korea, and the US, which have 589, 519, and 484 respectively at the time of writing. Do note, however, that if one is trying to ascertain the strength of a navy, gross size is a useful metric for sure, but it isn't the metric that one should render their judgment by, and there are other factors to consider, chief among which is the actual composition of the fleets, as not every ship is equally lethal or useful. To demonstrate this point, take a note of the fact that the US currently has 11 aircraft carriers as opposed to China's three, or two and a half really, given the Fujian has yet to be commissioned. This alone forms the basis of an argument for the US Navy currently being the strongest in the world, even before we start discussing escort and supporting vessels, as the difference in firepower is simply unfathomable. And that segues us nicely to a particular question. Is the Chinese Navy actually any good, or is it just a paper tiger? To answer that, let's start to bring this video to a close and mull it over. So is it any good? Ultimately, a question as big as this one isn't something that can be answered within the short confines of a primer such as this. It is a big, and above all else, a very subjective matter, and for us to attempt to shovel a hard answer down your throat would just be intellectually dishonest on our part. So instead, we urge you to form your own opinion on it, both from what you've learned in this video and anything else you might happen to know. And just to help get those almonds activated and the old Noggins jogging, here's a couple of expert opinions. First, oh, we have Andrew Erickson, a professor of strategy at the US Naval War College and member of the China Maritime Studies Institute. He is adamant in his belief that the US still rules the waves, but stresses that China has made such blistering progress with its naval modernization that the US may soon find itself challenged for the crown. He draws particular attention to China's development of advanced anti-ship ballistic missiles such as the YJ-21, a Mach 10 capable hypersonic missile with a range of just under a thousand miles, noting that China is likely building up vast quantities of these missiles in order to be able to equal the playing field with enemy navies were a war to break out. If nothing else, the idea that China is proactively thinking about the playing field at all and not just relying on its paper numbers is certainly compelling evidence as to their navy's quality. And then there's Felix Chang of the US-based Foreign Policy Research Institute who holds a similarly flattering position as he believes that China has achieved its dreams of acquiring a blue water navy and only seems poised to increase its capabilities further from here, specifically citing the 16 replenishment oilers that it now operates as well as the fact that China has been developing shore-based replenishment options through support bases and dual-use commercial ports in strategic locations across Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia both of which are vital, if admittedly less sexy, parts of successfully operating a blue water navy. Further to that, Chang also cites the mega military drills that China regularly conducts in the East China Sea. These drills always have one of China's carriers operating for weeks on end, conducting many dozen of fighter sorties with the full support of a strike group and being continually resupplied while doing so, a feat that Chang believes is a clear sign of the growing power of the Chinese Navy, as such drills are typically logistically and financial nightmares to operate. So are they correct? Well, it's an interesting question to mull over for sure, and we encourage you to do so in the comments below. But to be honest, we kind of hope that we never have to find out.